It's not well known, but about one of every five researchers who comes to the Kennedy Presidential Library comes not for information related to President Kennedy, but rather for our remarkable Hemingway collection. The Kennedy Library holds about 95% of the existing papers and artifacts of the Nobel Prize winner, who many consider to be America's greatest writer. We encourage you to support this collection, and information about Friends of the Hemingway is on your chair. During his final few years, few people were closer to Ernest Hemingway than our speaker this evening, Valerie Hemingway. And she told me just a few minutes ago that Ernest Hemingway was the most interesting person she has ever met. When she first met Hemingway, she was Valerie Danby Smith a 19-year-old Dubliner assigned to interview him for the Irish Times. Ernest Hemingway was enchanted by her and persuaded Valerie to join his entourage as his personal secretary. In her marvelous new book, Running with the Bulls, My Years with the Hemingways, we travel with her and Ernest Hemingway to bullfights and to bars, to France and to Cuba. We meet Ernest Hemingway in his troubled but intense final years through her eyes. And we learn more about his life and writing as she joins his fourth wife, Mary, in packing up Hemingway's house in Cuba after his death. She spent years sorting through the papers that eventually became to be donated here to the Kennedy Library. And some years later, she married one of Ernest's sons, Gregory, which explains the Hemingway last name. Norman Mailer has called Running with the Bulls, quote, one of the best books on Hemingway that I have read. Valerie has generously agreed to sign copies of the books in our museum store after this evening's forum. Moderating tonight's conversation is Oskold Melnichuk, Director of Creative Writing at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, since 2002. An award-winning novelist, his stories, poems, and reviews have appeared in numerous anthologies and in the Partisan Review, the New York Times, and the Nation, as well as many other publications. He is the founder and was the longtime editor of Agni and has been active in Penn, New England, with whom the Kennedy Library co-sponsors the Penn Hemingway Awards each spring. Oskold, I turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh much, Deborah, and uh, welcome to the audience. We're going to speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, you, five years ago, in 1999, the Hemingway Archives, along with the, Chem the Kennedy Library, the Hemingway Society, Penn New England, and a number of other organizations, hosted a celebration honoring the centenary of Hemingway's birth. Acknowledging their debt to him were the Japanese Nobel Prize winner, Ken Zaburo Oe, the South African writer Nadine Gordimer, uh, the St. Lucian poet Derek Walcott, the Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe, uh, along with such American writers as Robert Stone, Annie Prue, Bob Shakoches. What impressed me about that weekend was the many Hemingways that were uncovered over the course of our conversations. Um, first, there was Hemingway the writer. There was Hemingway, the, the traveler, the adventurer, the hunter, the aficionado, the lover, the father. Certainly one of the most moving presentations was Derek Walcott's panegyric on the beauty of a page of Hemingway's prose. The Hemingways we find in your book, Valerie, fascinating, deeply moving. The, in that memoir, all of those Hemingways are contained. And I wonder if we could begin uh, with a, a, that, your first meeting with Hemingway. You were a 19-year-old girl straight out of Dublin, on, uh, living in Madrid, and had received an assignment to interview the man. How did that, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, there I was, living in Madrid. I'd come from Dublin because I'd wanted to be a journalist. And the, in those days, one didn't go to college, to journalism school. You went into, uh, worked at a newspaper, got a practical uh, um, uh, 
background in it. And uh, there wasn't much going on in Dublin in terms of, I mean, there were lots of characters in Dublin, but in terms of the, the young person starting out, uh, there weren't many opportunities. So the uh, uh, managing editor of the Irish Times suggested I go to, um, well, go abroad, and I had the opportunity to go to Spain and, and send back dispatches from there. And I did attach myself to a Belgian news service, and it was they, in fact, who sent me to, to uh, meet Hemingway and, and to interview him, and they told me where to go, the Hotel Suecia, and that I should... Um, ask him certain questions. And being 19 and interested in all sorts of things, but not necessarily the assignment I was given, I did not do any background checking. So uh, Hemingway agreed to see me. I, I sat in, in the lunch, uh, in the dining room, and I looked around saying, you know, which one could be Hemingway? I had a tiny uh, a penguin paperback book, and, and I didn't know that the photograph was 16 years old. And uh, so I was looking for someone who was uh, about 45 or 44, and uh, I said to the waiter, that must be, could that be the North American writer, um, Ernest Hemingway? And he said, he looked, he said, no, 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 senorita, right over there is the, uh, uh, the great uh, Don Ernesto. And um, I looked over, and here was this man with completely white hair, beard, uh, at the head of a table, about 10 people around him, and so I made note of it. I thanked the, the waiter, and I, when Hemingway and crowd left, I slipped into the lobby, and I asked him if, if I could have an interview with him. And he, asked, he told me to come back the next day. I did mention I was Irish, and that certainly caught his attention. And the next day, so I was sitting up in the hotel room in, in the uh, suite there on a sofa, and he was sitting on a chair, and... Um, and I started out with my first question, you know, why is it, you, Mr. Hemingway, you've come back to Spain, uh, Franco's still in power, you haven't been here since the Spanish Civil War. And he said, well, no, on the contrary, I have been back to Spain, you know, and then, and recently, he'd been there on his way, when he was on his, going on his way to uh, his safari in Africa. So I thought, well, what do I do now? So I um, started talking about the, the thing that I knew most about, which was Irish literature. And we talked about various, various things. And he told me right away that James Joyce had been a great friend of his. And I told him that when I was 16 in, in London, I brought back a copy of uh, Joyce's Ulysses to, Lon to Dublin. It was banned in Dublin. Uh, it was banned in Ireland. Um, and uh, it cost 10 and sixpence, which was a great deal of money. That would have been about a dollar and a half at that point. But um, So he loved that story. And I also told him how I came to, to read the first book of his that I read, which was uh, The Sun Also Rises. But it was called Fiesta. Uh, that was the British title because uh, The Sun Also Rises comes from uh, the... Um, the Bible, and, and in England, certainly at that time, you could not use uh, any quotation from the Bible, so they called it Fiesta. I had my, my best school friend, I used to visit her in the south of Ireland and in the summertime, and her uncle was on the censorship board, and when we were teenagers, you know, we were terribly interested in all this sort of thing, you know, why things were being censored and, and what was being censored, and, and, you know, we ought to know about it. So she said, well, we can go and look at those books there, you know, we'll distract uh, the family, we'll go in. <laughs> and we did. And I had just come back from, from Spain. My uncle, a priest, I mean, a lot of this is in the book, uh, had invited me uh, to go on a pilgrimage to Lourdes with him. And uh, because I was the only girl in the family, I come from a, a family of three boys and a girl, and I have three boys and a girl. And my mother was one of three boys and a girl. So we've had generations of that. But being the only girl, there were a lot of disadvantages, like having to wash the dishes and make my brother's beds and, and so on. But, but the advantage was that when, you know, when one person was going to be chosen, it was easy to just say, let's take the girl. So I, I had, when I had been to Spain, I just thought it was the most wonderful country. Um, and I, wanted, I knew I wanted to go back there again. So when I looked at this shelf of books, uh, and I pulled out this one, and it, it had a, an arena and a, a bullfighter in, in 
bull in the middle, and I said, you know, and I slipped it and put it in my pocket, of course not intending to keep it. I thought I'll read it and return it, but you know, you know how that is with books. <laughs> never lend anyone a book because it just never comes back again. So, uh, so I read this fiesta, and, um, and so I was able to tell Hemingway that his, he was delighted to know that his books were banned in Ireland, <laughs> along with Joyce's and all, all the good people. Were, were banned. Yeah. So did I answer your uh, question? <laughs> wonderfully, wonderfully. Um, Hemingway wasn't, uh, I hope this isn't too shocking to reveal it to us in the book, but he wasn't your favorite writer. You had a longer list. Were... That's right. And you know, I had I had spent 14 years in the convent from when I was three to when I was uh, 17. So uh, practically all of my library, all, all of my reading uh, was uh, Catholic uh, authors, you know, we had Evelyn Waugh, Graham Greene, uh, G.K. Chesterton, uh, Butler's Lives of the Saints, you know, all these sort of things. And, and even though when I read Fiesta, I mean, it didn't strike me uh, as, you know, that this, this, I want to read more of this author. You know, I thought this, this is curious and this is interesting and I want to go back to Spain, but I didn't put Hemingway on my list of favorite authors. And this, he, he was really, um, I think, um, more than amused by this, be amused by it, because, um, because at that time, in 1959, he couldn't walk anywhere or go anywhere without people, I mean, people would come and touch him. It was rather like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I shouldn't make the comparison, but it was a bit like Jesus, you know, people wanted to touch and people wanted, I mean, even now people ask me, you know, do you have anything that Hemingway touched? I mean, could you, do you have a piece of paper you could give me a, a corner of, you know? I mean, it's like the relics of the saints. And, uh, but, but in, uh, I was just amazed in Spain how people followed him and, and they, in fact, just the other night I did a reading and somebody came up, the children of, of somebody who had been in Spain, a young, he was a young person like myself, an American he, though he was, in Spain in 1959, and he situated himself close enough to Hemingway that someone took a photo, so both of them are in it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a third person in the middle, and, or, or in between, and with, the back, with their back, and he thought maybe it might be me, but you know, it turned out to be Annie Davis. I couldn't say it was me, but, but they had me sign this photograph. But that's the way it was. I mean, everybody just absolutely adored him. And, uh, and I was, you know, it just didn't seem like such a big deal, which shows my ignorance. Not, <laughs> but, but that amused him very much. So he was always, you know, he would say, you know, have you read the short story? You have to read, you know, and he'd give me his book and say, you know, and then he'd say, well, now what did you think of that? So, I mean, it just wasn't a passive thing. I had to, I had to read, and then the master told me, um, well, he wanted, he didn't actually tell me that I had to have any opinion one way or the other, but he wanted to see what a fresh reader of a completely different generation w would take of his work. So I have to ask, did you ever criticize him? Um, you know, I was brought up in this very ultra-polite Irish society, so, uh, you know, I mean, later in, in my book, I talk about Mary, how Mary was absolutely forthright and open, and she just said what she thought, and sometimes I wished I could do that, but no, I mean, we were taught that if you don't have something good to say, keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned your upbringing, and, and it too had its singularities that in some ways uh, seemed to have prepared you for that meeting, that fateful encounter with Hemingway in various unlikely ways. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about growing up in Dublin in the 40s and about your mother and father. You, your um, mother was a, a Catholic who had been raised in England and your father was a Protestant who had been raised in Ireland, is that right? That's right. I mean, my family, um, they didn't seem unusual to me because nobody, you know, you, you take your people for granted. But in fact, as I grew up, I, I realized there were tremendous contradictions. Um, my mother was English indeed, and she, um, but she had an Irish, her mother was Irish, her father was English. So she had a little bit of, of leaning towards, towards Ireland. My father was Irish Protestant. And his name was Smith. And when my mother met him, she had great aspirations for herself. She was a um, musician and, and um, dancer. And I mean, not professionally, but she had studied and got her degree uh, at the um, Royal College of Music in London. 
and um, she had great aspirations. And when she met my father, he was very charming. They met in Dublin at a cricket club. And when he said his name was Smith, she was, you know, she thought he was joking, you know, because Smith was, you know, that was the, um, the name you give when you're going incognito, you know, you say your name's Smith, so that nobody knows that you're really Lord, uh, you know, Dunsany or someone, you know. You're, so, uh, I mean, she really didn't think... That, that it could be true because he was too handsome and bright to have a name like Smith. That, that was the way. My, mom, my mother had very odd ideas about life. And so they, when they married, she insisted that they hooked the name together and it became Danby Smith, which was really a millstone around my neck because when I went to school in Ireland, you know, everybody is O'Sullivan and Murphy and Kelly, and, and that's lovely. And, but, and you say your name is Danby Smith, and they think you come from another planet, and, and at that, a hostile planet. You know, it was not a name. I remember, and I put this in the book because it, it just stuck in my mind so much. My Irish teacher, teacher of Gaelic, you know, always said, uh, nobody with the name of Danby Smith is going to be able to speak Irish. You know, that's, just don't even try, which, of course, made made me learn it and learn it very well. Um, but uh, So that was a disadvantage. But when I was three, I mean, things sort of ambled along, except my father had a real taste for liquor, which, which was very Irish, that was the thing. Um, and uh, when the war came along, he joined the British Army, which a lot of Irish people did. It was um, a way, I mean, even in the 40s uh, in Ireland, employment was uh, very hard to come by although my father had inherited uh, uh, a business from his father who died very young of the drink. It was, it was almost like a, a, a patriotic and, and fine thing to die of the drink in Ireland. <laughs> uh, so, no, you know, people sort of took care of, of, of families where, where that had happened. It was as if they'd gone to war and, <laughs> and died for la patria. But my parents did, my, when my father went over to England, my mother, I think, panicked, and she went over to England after him, and she stayed with her, her um, father. But she seemed to completely forget, or, or anyway, not take note of the fact that there were, there were two children uh, born and, and I was three, my brother was five. Actually, there was a third child. I don't go into too much because he, he didn't live with us uh, for a while, but that's, that's another story. But anyway, Peter and myself, uh, we were sent off. My Protestant aunt Constance came to the rescue all through my childhood. My Protestant aunt Constance, I, I, I say the word Protestant because it was sort of pejorative in the Catholic society I grew up in in Ireland. And yet she was the good angel. She came and, and she put us in the convent. I mean, she, she persuaded the nuns to take us. And so we, uh, I was there from when I was three until when I was 17. And um, it, it was very much a sort of scholarly um, endeavor because the nuns were serious. They had become... They had their vocations. Generally, in those days, from the age of 15 or 16, girls entered the convent... Uh, they did study. These were the Dominicans. Most of them had higher degrees, but they'd got them after they became nuns, and they were totally dedicated to teaching. So we, we spent our, we really did learn a lot and enjoy learning, but we didn't, we weren't allowed to get up to a lot of shenanigans. I mean, any little thing we did, like something like, well, I would not have brought my book Ulysses to the convent because that would have been instant, <laughs> instant expulsion. But, but we did, uh, I think it, it was a very unusual childhood, uh, but obviously the same childhood that other people in my, you know, at the time had. I mean, very unusual looking back on it now. And then I should say that in the holiday time, uh, my parents never got back together again. So we were, the first, those early summers, we went to this little country, um, it, it was a boarding house at the time, and they took in, the family wanted to make a little extra money, and so they took in uh, children who had been what I called orphaned by the war, whose parents, like my parents, had gone off. So initially, there were about 15 or 18 children all together in this house, and it was very jolly in the holidays, and nobody thought about, you know, poor me, I'm not living at home with my parents and family. And several of those, there were two or three siblings there, like us. There were two of us, but there were three 
in, in several instances. And, but gradually, after the war, all these other children disappeared, and Peter and I were just left there. <laughs> we were never picked up. And uh, that, uh, in 1946, when I was six, the, uh, the boarding house became a hotel, and it became uh, a place where artists and writers uh, used to come out. It was in Enniskerry, a beautiful little village in County Wicklow, just south of Dublin. Now it's, it's really a bedroom community for this town. It was 12 miles away from Dublin. But going to Dublin was like a complete adventure. One can't imagine it now. Nobody had a car then. Early on, we had ponies and traps. So going to Dublin would have been almost a day, a whole day. But uh, during those holidays, I spent time uh, um, meeting all these people, and I spent hours and hours and hours listening to stories, because, you know, the Irish are great raconteurs, and, and they, oh, you know, I would, nobody would notice, because there wasn't anyone to say it's your bedtime, or you've got to, and nobody really noticing where we were. So Peter and I learned a great deal about literature and art and what was going on in the world, and... And, uh, and it was a tremendous um, contrast to the rather austere convent. So I had this sort of rather wild, I mean, at least observing the wild. It wasn't so wild for us. Only perhaps the wildest thing was when somebody uh, gave us, injudiciously gave us uh, clay pipes, and we went through the ashtrays and took out all the, th that, those were the days before filter cigarettes, and we got all the, all the tobacco out of the, the, the butts and put them in our clay pipes, and we went out to the barn and we lit them and got thoroughly sick. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned that it was a contrast, and I just want to underscore what an extreme contrast it appeared to be in the book, because you mentioned that among the other sort of occupants or presences in the, in the convent were deaf mutes, and uh, you also mentioned that there were no mirrors in the convent, and that the only use you had for newspapers there was, were in, the, was in the toilet, uh, so that, in fact, it was just wonderful... It's interesting the things that, you know, people who read the book, I mean, I just know all of that, so it doesn't seem odd to me, but I suppose it does seem odd to someone else. Um, in in the, the convent had, um, well, there were three parts to it. There was the girls' school, which was a junior and senior school, so that was from first form, up, which was first grade up to 12th, roughly. And then there was a boys' school, which was first to sixth, because in, in, over there, it's six and six, the, 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 the form of education. So Peter was there till he was 12. Um, and then the third component, component was a, a school for the deaf, which started out as a foundling school. Um, in fact, maybe not even school. But in, in, as late as nine, the 1940s, if parents had a deaf child, they often just took, bundled the baby up, or at whatever age they discovered this, and just left it on the on the uh, stoop of the of the school, and never ever the the child had no um, no parentage noted, no history, nothing, never ever to be uh, found again or belong to anyone. And so these girls, they were all girls. They grew up in this school. And when I first went there, it was really a very antiquated thing. The, what happened was when the girls grew up, when they were teenagers, they started learning, uh, you know, to, to um, how to clean and mop and, and do all the, the menial work. And they actually, the, the entire school was run uh, not run, but, but they were the, the people who did all the work from the farm. Everything, it was like a medieval village because the, the, um, and, and it was entirely run by women. There were no men there at all, but they, from slaughtering the beasts that we had, you know, the, the, any meat, everything we had came from the, the, from the farm. The vegetables came from the garden. The linens, the flax was grown and linens were made and all the linens for the, for the nuns' habits and for the, the beds. Uh, it, it was amazing, really. Every, or everything came, it was totally self-sufficient at that time. But in the early 50s, uh, quite a bit of research was done on, on deaf, uh, um, on the condition and, and how it could be, uh, uh, you know, ameliorated and or maybe um, uh, reversed. And uh, I must say that the, that the nuns didn't say, oh, dear, here goes our free help. Because those people never, they lived in the convent, never left the convent. They were, 
you know, like the nuns, but they, the nuns at least knew they had relatives somewhere, but the, children, the, the young deaf people didn't. They, um, uh, once Cabra learned that there was a possibility that, that with medicine these uh, girls, uh, you know, some of them could be helped, they immediately did uh, start to educate them and to look into the possibilities of, of reversing uh, the, these children's plight. And by the time I left there, uh, Cabra was one of the pioneering places in Europe for um, education for the deaf. So that was a very nice story in itself. Of course, the school went down, not went downhill, but it became impossible for the, the school now doesn't exist any longer because, you know, the costs of things, they, they had complete free help for the whole school. They had to change, uh, you know, things had to change. And, but, but it was for the good, for the good of, um, you know, the, the young people. Adjusting to the new economies. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the Duns who ran Summerhill were your true family, but you did, while you were living at Summerhill, occasionally see your mother and father mm -hmm. spend summers with them. And um, could you describe your relationship with both your mother and your father at that time? Yes. Well, actually, I never spent summers with them. My father came back to Ireland in 1948. I think he, he came back. I mean, I think the, the story was that he'd got into gambling debt, so he couldn't return to Ireland. He did come in 48, but he shouldn't, he had to, there was a period when he wasn't supposed to return or else he could have been in big trouble. But when he came back, it was, he did take us out and it was wonderful because it was the one time, uh, even at the hotel, that the Duns, this family who took us in, who had taken in the other children too, but who continued with us, we were, at the time we should have left there and gone back to our parents, but the parents at this point hadn't, whatever, whether it was no interest or what, whatever reason they didn't take us back. Um, the, the Duns, you know, had this, had this dilemma, this moral dilemma, because um, my father was in a better position than my mother to take us, and, but if we went to my father in England, we would have been brought up Protestant. So they had this tremendous dilemma. We, we had all this uh, talking to about if you go to your, uh, uh, you know, do you want to go and live with your father? And, you know, we say, oh, yes, of course, we do go to England. That sounds wonderful. You know, children, they say, you say yes, and it'd be great to be with a parent. And then they'd say, but if you do that, you know, your soul will be in, in uh, mortal <laughs> danger. And, and, you know, you could go to hell forever. I mean, do you want to do that? And then you'd say, well, no, of course not. You, you know, so there was always this, this thing came up, this crisis came up periodically in my childhood. So we never went to, to live with my father and actually saw less and less of him until I later I saw him in England a few times. But my mother was a different matter. We used to, my brother and I would go and visit my mother once a week in the summertime. And that was, it was a rather, she lived in a boarding house in Dublin with my youngest brother, um, Michael, who now lives up in Canada and is a professor of philosophy. One, actually, my brothers turned out to be great, but um, <laughs> they, we would go and visit. My mother, um, she, well, she always thought that, that it would, was a temporary situation. She didn't think we were going to be divided forever and ever, but she, um, when we went there, she would uh, insist, she had special clothes that we wore, clean clothes. So we had to have a bath and then showers weren't uh, you know, showers didn't really come in in Ireland until later. And then we put on these clean clothes. And then she always gave us books and she'd take us to the theater. So I learned, you know, I mean, I had this limited um, time with my mother. But it, it, in a way, it was very fruitful because I learned, you know, the Duns, these country people, did not think that book, they thought books were perdition. I mean, apart from going to one's father in England and becoming a Protestant, if you read books <laughs> other than and prayer books, you were very likely to end up, um, you know, a long time in purgatory or something worse. So, um, so, but my mother did have a, you know, she was a, a different, had a different outlook, and she, she really introduced me to literature. And in fact, I don't put it in the book, but on my 12th birthday, she took me uh, to see the movie of uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and she made me learn uh, the name of the person. And the only earnest I'd ever heard of before that was the importance of being earnest, Oscar Wilde, another Irish writer. So... Um, 
so my mother was instrumental in her funny, absent way of, of uh, you know, for my love of literature um, and, and the theater, because those were the two things that she really um, insisted that we, we um, spend time at and enjoy. Not insisted we enjoy, but hoped we'd enjoy it. You mentioned that the Duns frowned on imaginative literature, and yet their home became a magnet for artists and writers. How did that come about? And was that where you first met Brendan Bean? Or? Well, in um, Ireland, there's, in Ireland particularly, um, literature and drink seem to go together. I mean, I met so many writers who uh, really never, they never wrote the book that they were going to write because they were talking about uh, they were talking about writing, and they were drinking, and by the time they finished talking and drinking, uh, nothing got written. So the, many of the writers I knew, and there were a few that I met, and, and Brendan Bean was one of them, at, uh, who did it, uh, accomplish something, and Patty Kavanaugh, and, um, you know, there were some, some really good writers. But, you know, actually, when you met them, you, you, you wondered how they ever sat down and, dra and <laughs> drank a, and sat down and wrote a word. <laughs> How did they find time to do it? Thinking of it all that writing, uh, yes. somebody like Kavanaugh. Um, you, um, Brendan Bean, winds up uh, winding through your life uh, in very important ways. Do you re have any sort of strong first impressions? Well, I met Brendan. Uh, he came out to the hotel when I was sixteen, and I can remember he he was a person who. I mean, I remember he noticed me. A lot of the people that I, I met, I more observed, you're you know, because you you were yes, and because I left when I was about seventeen and a half, I left the con, I mean, left both the convent and 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 the scary, but uh, he, he had a way with him. Uh, he always um, noticed people, talked to them. I mean, in that way, he was a bit like Ernest in that. I mean, he didn't. Feel I'm the great writer. Come and, and pay homage to me. He always wanted to meet people, talk to them, know more about them. And so uh, we just had a, a, you know a sort of talking acquaintance at that time. And when I finished school and spent time in in Dublin, wanting um, very much to write, but uh, you know maybe if I'd stayed in Dublin, I would still be in the pubs talking about writing, uh, like <laughs> like all those other people. But uh, so I would run into to Brendan every now and then, uh, as one does. Dublin's a very small, it still is a small place, although now it's quite affluent and quite different from, from what it was. I mean, in those days, it was a walking town. Nobody had a car. Uh, you might have a bicycle. That was the way to get around. But uh, it, so, so that you were inclined in if you were in Dublin at all, you were going to run into people. I mean, there was no way they were going to avoid you because there they were. I mean, there were front and back doors to all the pubs. That's true. But, you know, you, <laughs> after a while, you got, if, if you wanted to meet someone, you, you got quite savvy about which way, which direction to go in. But uh, I, I, I had many, a, a number of writer friends, but Brendan was always very... Um, he loved to talk and he would give advice because I remember, actually it was quite an accident that I went to see him before I went to Spain. I went to see um, somebody else. I went to see Terry Cronin, my friend, and, and, and whose husband at that time was the head of the IRA. But he was in the car. Well, he, he should have been in the car. He was supposed to be in the prison, but he had, was on the run. Uh, so, and Terry wasn't there, and then I went on to see, because I wanted to tell my friends I'm, I'm actually going to Spain. You know, people in Ireland, we talk a lot, and we say we're going to do things, and very often the saying almost, you know, it, it sort of carries you through, you know. Um, but I wanted to tell them I actually am going to Spain. And, and so, and then I went to see, to, to find Kevin and Pan Collins. Kevin was the film uh, re reviewer for the Irish Times uh, at the time, and his wife, Pan, wonderful person, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, who, who, who had an ancestor, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, but a man, uh, uh, and she came from a great family, was a cousin of, um, oh dear, um, I'll have to come back to that, the Irish uh, writer, uh, right. O'Brien. Um, Not flat O'Brien. Uh, no, no. Okay. Who, who, who's he's written a lot and, and was down in Africa. Was a diplomat. Um, okay. 
come back. Anyway, uh, Pan was one of the first people. Television was just starting up there in 1957, and um, she got involved in television, and, and until she died, she was she was working with the Late Show, which was sort of the equivalent of your um, uh, um, Jay, Leno. Jay Leno. Yes, exactly. And uh, but I, so I went to find them, and I couldn't find them, and so then I just kept because you walked, and I, so I walked a little bit further, and there I thought, well, I'm now close to Anglesey Road, so I'll go into the Bean's house. So I went there, and Brendan was there, but Beatrice was off uh, doing something. So Brendan, he wasn't drinking at the time, so he said, um, well, he, he said, I'll put the kettle on, which, of course, is what you do if you go into an Irish house. You know, they said, we'll put the kettle on. And uh, he made a cup of tea, and we started talking about going to, uh, uh, we started, I talking about my going to, uh, to Spain. And, you know, he said to me, what would you want to do that for? Why would you want to go to a, a, a country that has a horse's ass for a, for a leader? You know, <laughs> when you could, you know. So um, anyway, I, I told him I was on my way. And then he told me, and I, this was, I told um, Hemingway, I mean, this was another reason we sort of solidified our um, friendship when, when I first met <coughs> him. Because I had, you know, as a 19-year-old, I had this story. Uh, then Bian told me, well, you know, that he'd been to Spain. He'd gone to Mallorca, he, uh, and, and uh, it was at the height of his fame when, when uh, um, Borstal Boy had just come out, and at the same time, the hostage was on in London uh, at the court, uh, no, at the, um, anyway, the, the Joan Littlewood's Theatre in London. And so he was a big success in Europe. I think it was, it was also on in, in Paris. And when he got off the plane, uh, he was met by a bevy of reporters because there's, there's a, a, a nice link between Ireland, Catholic Ireland, and Catholic Spain, you know, at, at that time. And so they were delighted to have him. They said, uh, Mr. Bean, what would you like to see most in, in Spain? And he just looked up at them, and he said, Franco's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, he got, uh, there, there was, a, you know, absolute dismay, and then he, he got sent back on, on, uh, as soon as they could. I think they kept him overnight and sent him back. So he didn't see anything in Spain, and so he, he sort of said, well, I, I would just avoid going there. I didn't spend more than my 24 hours there weren't worth it, so don't go. But... But anyway, I did. But I was able to tell Hemingway these stories, and, and he was delighted. That's, that's, one, that's a wonderful story and a wonderful moment in the book. And uh, um, I, I promise you we're getting to Hemingway. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, just before we do, I, you, on Easter 1959, on Sunday, you attended your first bullfight. I, I wonder if you could Yes, talk about I that. did. I had been in Spain. You know, when I went to Spain, I... Well, I didn't know what to expect, and, and you know, you often, when you're young, you just plunge. And so I went, but I felt, oh, I wonder what the theater is like. And so I started going to the theater in, in Dublin. Every few shillings I got, I would go to the Abbey Theater and to the other theaters, and, and you could do that for one and sixpence, two shillings. And uh, when I was in Spain, then I went off to the theaters there, and I found that they were playing, you know, Calderon. They were playing, you know, 18th century, um, you know, very um, stylized uh, plays that were really quite boring. I mean, I, I had a grasp of, of Spanish, but, um, you know, I knew that, <laughs> that they were, that this wasn't what I was looking for. And so I, I was with a family, a, teaching English to the, the children of the family. That was, I had my room and board, and I spent uh, two hours a day, I think, with the children and some weekends. And on Easter Sunday, the parents had gone off somewhere, and we, the chauffeur took us to the, to the bull ring, and we had these wonderful seats. And I saw this, and I said to myself, this is the drama. This is what I've been looking for, because this is the, the theater of Spain, is be, because it's live, the people participate, and, and there's something in it that, I mean, when you're at a bullfight, I mean, maybe when some people, I don't say everyone, but it was, there was something in it that I felt was akin to what I'd felt in the theater in, in Dublin. And I said, this is going to be my new theater. And it was only, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after that that I met the Hemingways. And so I got to see lots and lots of bullfights. And with <coughs> Ernest telling me, uh, you know, what was happening, what I should look for, how to judge, how to judge, well, first of all, how to judge the bulls, and then how to judge 
the bullfighter, and then all the other elements that come in, the wind and the, you know, the different things that, uh, you know, and the whole thing, how it, how it uh, comes together. And, you know, I was so lucky. If you wanted to know something about something, the person to ask was Ernest, or, or to wait till he, he was ready to tell you. In, in Death in the Afternoon, Hemingway writes about uh, bullfighting as something that um, taught him or helped him to learn how to write. And he said that one of the things that bullfighting did was focus you on the great drama, the tragedy. So the very sort of theater that you found there was also the theater that gave him the kind of perspective he felt he needed as a writer. I, I wonder, did you find other kinds of, um, did you get other advice about writing or ideas about writing from him? Well, he, writing was absolutely sacred to him. And uh, he did, you, you know, in writing, it was more my observing him that, rather than him saying, this is what you should do. I mean, what he told me, he told me, you, you've really got to, you've got to live and experience things. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure he said the same things over and over again, like, you write one true sentence, and then you <coughs> go from there. And always write what you know, you know, don't fake it. You just write what you know. Um, he, um, I mean, I observed him, I think, in fact, I, I sort of got a paralysis, I would say, in terms of, of writing. When I was around him, it just seemed like there is no point. I mean, why would anyone else want to write, you know? I mean, well, you, you know, because, because here, and, and at the time he kept showing, first his own stuff, you read this, because the first thing he said, if you want to be a writer, you read all the great writers. I mean, that was rule number one. That's before you even take up the pen or pencil. And, uh, and he kept thrusting books at me because, of course, it was very easy. I mean, almost everything he said, have you read this? I was able to say no. <laughs> and instead of that being bad, that was good because I was able to then um, read it. You know, and he'd say this edition or that. You know, I know he, was, he loved Constance. Garnett's um, translations. Whoops, sorry. Of, uh, and <laughs> yes, yeah. and um, it, so that I learned a great deal there. I also, you, you know, in observing him, I know he, he. I never saw him write because he would get up in the morning, go to his desk, and write. And that was the first thing he did every day, no matter what. And then when he finished writing, that's when he would emerge, uh, have his breakfast, and and do things, and we worked in the afternoon when I worked with him, for him, you know, I, he, we, first of all, the correspondence, and then I did some typing of the a movable feast, and, um, uh, you know, whatever else needed to be done, notes on that he was writing A Dangerous Summer at the time. It was just uh, called The Bullfight Piece, and A movable Feast was called The Paris Sketches, <laughs> Everything was sort of was simple and had a good good name to it, but it, it, when he wrote, I mean, the things that he told me, like hints that that were good for him, he said, if ever you get into um, a bind when you're writing, you absolutely stick with it till you get out of that. You stay with it, and then when you're writing well, even though you want to continue, you stop, so that the next morning when you get out of bed and you start to write. You, you are, have something to go with. And, um, and I think that is, is wonderful advice if one can do it. I think it's a matter of training oneself. Um, I know, I mean, when I was with him, I didn't do any creative writing at all. I mean, I just felt it's useless. I mean, how could I even start? <laughs> but I learned a lot. Every writer I know, um draws on some of Hemingway's bon mots and advice about writing. Uh, there's that famous passage again, uh, oddly enough, as I was rereading the book in Death in the Afternoon, where he talks about the importance of having um, seven-eighths of the iceberg of the story mm -hmm. submerged and the one-eighth, the story that you tell, uh, carry the, and, and suggest the weight of all that is untold and omitted. So he, he had a sort of art of omission. Mm -hmm. but, I've, this is just a moment I can't miss. I, th that you, you mentioned that sentence of Hemingway's about writing the truest thing you know when you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And men, I, so many friends and I have discussed that sentence and wondered what that actually meant. <laughs> how, did, how did you translate that? That's, um, well, it, it, 
I suppose it's quite different for everyone because, you know, truth is, um, is, is sort of relative. I mean, I think with Hemingway, it was, I mean, when you read his writing, it's, it's just so amazing in terms of how he puts things down and how right it is. I mean, somebody asked me the other day, you know, why is it that he's so popular today? And I think it's because it's so true. You know, I, I was just uh, a year or so ago, um, my son Sean put together a Hemingway anthology on war. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, you know, I've just been reading those pieces. And, and they were so apt, you, if, if you read them, there's, they just apply exactly to today. And that's because they're true. And now you're gonna, if you ask me what true is, it, it's like the essence of things. Mm -hmm. But I guess each person has uh, a certain truth. You know, I mean, there are, there are the truth, you know. But there's your own truth, too, that, that makes your writing individual and, uh, you know, so that, that everything isn't just generic. There is, each person has their own truth. And I think that's only something that you can know. I, I think that, that gets, certainly gets at it. The essence mm -hmm. of things is what he said the bullfight did for him, it distilled things to their essence of life and death in a, mm -hmm. few, in a few short moments. Um, I was wondering if you'd uh, read a short passage uh, yes. that uh, really just mm -hmm. so marvelously okay. conveys the, well, what it was like to be in Hemingway's company. Sort of and right this is the traveling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Traveling with Ernest was never dull. He was a man of extremes. When he enjoyed life, as he did on that trip, he enjoyed it to the fullest, and he had the gift of being able to impart his pleasure and enthusiasm to those around him. He unleashed his imagination and could be deeply sensitive. He tended to exaggerate greatly, and mostly this was fun and enhanced every activity. But there was a dark side. An enemy was a deadly enemy, usually for keeps. A grudge was jealously guarded, and loyalty and friendship was demanded. He had the most inquiring mind of anyone I've ever met. Although his knowledge was vast and diverse, he constantly deferred to those around him asking their opinion, and valuing the answer. He often drew upon Bill Davis's knowledge of Spain, architecture, and modern art. He used to tell me that I was a lot smarter than he was, but that he knew more because he had been around longer. Although he'd been on these roads many times, it was as though he was seeing Provence for the first time. He noted the changes with interest not ennui. He might not have liked what he saw, but he analyzed and processed the changes instead of dismissing them. Each day was a new adventure, and I often felt that I was the aged and jaded one when I could not muster up enough enthusiasm for visiting yet another scene from his life or literature. Great. That's wonderful. You know, that, That's wonderful. It was, you know, because it, it was wonderful, but then sometimes his his um, uh, his sort of not his strength and you know he just never seemed to flag you know you you expected aha now he's going to need a rest but no <laughs> uh, he you know uh, he perhaps yeah, knew that this was the last time he'd be in Spain the last I mean I was with him the last time in Spain the last time in France the last time in Cuba you know. And I, he just, every ounce, I mean, it was a wonderful way to live, um, to enjoy every moment, or not even enjoy, but be aware every moment. I mean, sometimes, it, you know, as life is, you don't enjoy everything, but, but he was always aware. And that really opened my eyes because I had, I was inclined to be the sort of person who would be stuck in a book, you know, and not looking around me. And I learned from him how important it is to look around and see and see what's there, you know. Wonderful. Um, it was a very male world. Uh, in, in again, in a, uh, Death in the Afternoon, he writes, uh, girl inspection is a big part of bullfighting. Uh, did you ever feel out of place there? Well, I, I didn't, partly because I think I had three brothers. I just uh, had, and also because I was a sort of, 
well, I see myself. You know, it's funny how one sees oneself as a certain thing, maybe other people didn't, but I sort of saw myself in a way as a very retiring figure, sort of very quiet and listening to everything, but not people most of the time, I think, didn't even notice I was there. I think many people were surprised that I turned up a year later and two years later and then went on to work on, on the Hemingway papers because they just thought, you know, this is just some transient, um, you know, uh, hanger-on that... that that person will be gone soon, and somehow, you know, I endured, and now here I am, 40 so many years later, you know, still somewhat involved with Hemingway and Hemingway papers, Hemingway life, you know, and I don't know, I, I mean, it didn't bother me, the, the male, I mean, I just think they didn't yeah. notice yeah. me. I was <laughs> like the fly on the wall. <laughs> I, I, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> there are... Um, you mentioned how many people recognized Hemingway as you traveled, but you also have there's so many wonderful anecdotes in the book that I'm not going to be able to touch on uh, a tenth of them. But there, there's one moment where, uh, which I thought was especially funny and loaded, when uh, you um, when, when Hemingway was mistaken for Orson Welles. Yes, and uh, funnily enough, Orson Welles was one of the heroes of my youth because he had come to Ireland in the early 50s, I think, and had worked at the Gate Theatre with Hilton Edwards and Michal McLeamore. And uh, I, I loved the Gate Theatre and the history of it, and, and Orson Welles had gone there. And he came, he was in Ireland in 1958, and I made an attempt to meet him, and didn't, it didn't work out. But then when we came, we were approaching Paris, and at this point, it was just Bill Davis, Ernest, and myself. Mary and Annie Davis were already in Paris. And uh, Bill had, had booked for us to eat at this fantastic restaurant, whose the name I just cannot remember. But uh, we arrived there, and we sort of marching. We're looking forward to the food, because as you know, anyone, of, all of you who've read Ernest, food was very important. And so we're all imagining for about the hour before what we're going to order and how it's going to be and so on. And we arrive at the door, and Ernest is first, and, uh, and uh, the maitre d' bows low and says, uh, Welcome, bienvenue, Monsieur Wells. And <laughs> Ernest looked and said, Hemingway is the name. And, uh, and, we were, and then there were all these, oh, abject, oh, you know, oh, dear, oh, dear, you know, sorry, sorry. And uh, it turned out that Wells had um, called up the day before, ordered his meal, and uh, uh, wanted everything, you know, he had everything just set because he was another gourmand, absolutely gourmand deluxe. And uh, so we went in, and Ernest was just a bit irritated, and he had not, he, he'd had a, I don't know, it wasn't really a falling out with Wells, but he, he wasn't, he, he didn't think very highly of him. Uh, he rather thought he was a bit of a snob and a lightweight and various things like that. And, um, and then Wells came in, we were put in a, in a, we were given complimentary aperitifs, so that was to take the edge off things, and we had that, and we were put in a position where we could see Wells come in, and he sat at his table, and he put his napkin under his chin, and, and I remember it was a capon, I mean, I mean, he might have had something to begin with, he probably did, but I just remember this capon, the silver, uh, the silver hood over it, and all the, the, and we watched and watched, and Ernest was getting, I mean, it was really upsetting. <laughs> his, um, he wasn't enjoying his lunch as, as well as he might. And, and so I said, you know, I really would love to meet Orson Welles. I've wanted, you know. And so Ernest and said, well, I can do that, you know, no problem. So uh, we, we let him eat his lunch, Wells, that is, and then Ernest sent over a um, little note and uh, invited Wells to have brandy and coffee with us. And he came over and did, and, and we had a, a very jo I mean, it turned out to be just a wonderful meeting, and they forgot all of their um, differences. And Wells was a great, also a follower of the, the Bulls, and uh, he knew and admired Antonio Ordonez, who was uh, the, the, the leading bullfighter at the time and, and a great friend of protege of Ernest's. And uh, it ended, it, it, not that, lunch didn't end up, but, uh, but Wells's life ended when he, I mean, when his life ended, he had um, left uh, 
uh, instructions that his ashes be buried on Antonio Ordonez's um, a ranch in Spain, and indeed they are there to this day. So, uh, but that w- it was just a wonderful little sort of cameo, and we went on and, and um, we went on to Paris, and Wells joined us there, and and Ernest uh, invented a little club, and I had to go out and buy um, Swiss Army knives because everyone in the club was to have Swiss Army knives, and, <laughs> and Orson was the first to get one, and then Mary in, in, in this was. <laughs> To me, an embarrassing situation. Mary, for some reason, insisted that in, when we had lunch with, with Wells in Paris that I sing, which I'm not going to do tonight, folks, <laughs> that I sing Danny Boy in Irish, which I did, much to my embarrassment, and I could see that Wells was not the slightest bit impressed. <laughs> Um, we, in a few minutes, we're going to open the floor to questions, but there are at least two more matters that I want to, uh, uh, us to have a chance to touch on. And so I'm going to yank you out of Spain, which yes. we've only begun there and have barely touched on France, and very quickly deposit you in Havana and at Finca um, Bahia. Uh, what was it like uh, in uh, Havana in 1960, was it? 1960. We were there. I was there from, when well, we were all there from January to, to July. Well, for me, it was idyllic. It was my first time in the tropics, and I can't tell you how nice it is if you've grown up in the damp of <laughs> Ireland and you're never, ever warm, not even on the hottest day of summer, although I hear that things are, are a little better now with the global warming. At least <laughs> Ireland's going to benefit from it. But, uh, but I loved Cuba. Um, there was a rhythm to the life there. Uh, Mary and Ernest, I mean, the... the any disagreements they might have had in, in Spain and, and the drinking and all the hangers-on, the people and that, and the frenzy, and, and even though it was sort of fun, it was great fun for me in Spain. But when I went to Cuba, life was quiet. I mean, he, he, Ernest wrote every morning, swam in the pool, um, enjoyed his cats, went out fishing on the Pilar. Uh, we went to the Floridita. We dressed up, Mary and I dressed up on... Um, Saturday nights we went to the Floridita. Sunday afternoon, Ernest and I went to the cockfights. I learned, and one day, uh, uh, Joe Alsop of, of the Herald Tribune came along. We had a wonderful afternoon. But uh, so it, it started out. It was really great. Ernest was was writing mainly. He was writing the Dangerous Summer, and but he was also correcting and putting finishing touches to a movable feast, and. Um, but suddenly sort of a shadow came across our lives. Part of it was the, uh, the revolution, which um, was now, uh, Castro had sort of departed from his socialism and gone to, directly to communism and had come up against, um, uh, you know, the, the United States was unhappy with the direction Castro was taking, and not to speak of all the, uh, you know, American... Uh, the property and the, the interests in, in, in Cuba that America was losing out on because Castro started nationalizing everything. And so um, Phil Bonsell, who was the American ambassador, used to come to dinner every Thursday at the Finca. And we had these wonderful evenings. But in, I think it was April, he um, said that he wouldn't be coming anymore, that he'd been recalled, and that diplomatic relations were being um, severed between the two countries. And he strongly advised um, Ernest to leave Cuba. He said he actually had been asked by the American government to pass on, informally, to pass on the um, message that he should leave because it was a very bad example uh, he, because he was such a high-profile American, that if he stayed there, it would uh, it, it would be construed that he condoned the revolution and and the direction Cuba was going in. And Ernest, it, this was devastating for him. Because, you know, at first he sort of tried to argue and said, "Well, you know, I've been here through revolutions. Uh, dictators have come and gone. I, I write. I'm not involved in politics." Uh, the world knows I'm an American writer. There's, you know, I've, there's never been a question of my allegiance to my country. But, you know, he could see that uh, he probably would have to give up the Finca, and that was a devastating prospect. 
Plus, at the time, his, his health was declining, especially his eyesight. And uh, he depended on his eyes for sports, you know, fishing, for reading. He read about three books a week. Uh, he, um, the, the prospect really, um, I mean, it was an impossible situation and a, a depression set in. And, you know, we thought, Mary and I later discussed it, you know, said, how was it we didn't, we didn't catch on that Ernest needed help? and that, you know, that he, you know, perhaps he needed medical help. But it was the last thing we thought. We didn't think of it at all. We, we thought, you know, he's got plenty of reason to be depressed, and let's try and cheer him up. And, you know, but, but it, you know, you all know the story how, um, you know, we left Cuba. He did take some of his papers, but not very much out went back to Spain to double-check, uh, to see how the, the latest uh, bullfight season was going and to make sure that his bullfight piece, which was coming out in September in, in Life magazine, that it would be um, up to date. He was a you know, meticulous craftsman and, and you know, made sure that whenever he wrote something that, that it was as accurate as he could. Uh, so he insisted on going back to Spain, and I, I stayed in... in New York for a little while with Mary, and then I did go back and join him in Spain because I was, I was concerned. Uh, there had been a, a, a report in the paper that he had collapsed in the bull ring. It turned out to be false, as far as we know. But I just had this uneasiness, and I went back to Spain, and I hadn't seen him in about three weeks, and I was astounded at at how he'd lost a lot of weight. He, he just seemed very depressed, very concerned, and worried about everything around him. And, and he talked um, of suicide. And, you know, uh, one thing, you know, I, I just I did what I could to comfort him and hope that he would change his mind. But when we parted in Madrid uh, that, uh, in late 1960, he came back to the States and... Um, I just felt, you know, one day I'm just going to hear that he's dead, and that's what happened. But it was not for another six or seven months. Hmm. One last question from me, and then we'll open it up um, to the audience. So if people have questions, um, we might start lining up at the mic. I think there's just one mic in the center of the room. Um, one, of, one, one of the reasons for um, the, your long-lived connection with the Hemingway family was because at Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's funeral, you met um, Gregory Hemingway, Hemingway's son. I wonder if you'd speak for a few minutes about your, what, what happened after that meeting. Well, when we met, uh, the two of us were slight outsiders on that occasion because I was working, I just got myself a job at Newsweek, was very proud of it, and, and they were delighted to let me off to go to the funeral. Of course, they said, well, we'd love you to do a piece, but they knew that if, you know, I said, you know, that's not on, and they said, or, you know, that's up to you, we still give you the time to go. Mary realized when I got there that I was working for Newsweek. She had not asked, she'd made absolutely certain not to ask anyone, any journalist, even friends who were journalists, to the, to the funeral because it would be too tempting to write about it. And, um, and Greg was there, Ernest's youngest uh, son, and he uh, had had a falling out with his father and was not on good terms with Mary, so it turned out that the two of us were sort of, we found ourselves sitting together at one end of the Christiania Lodge, and we, so we spent the four days more or less um, <coughs> together and we had great fun I mean I just found that Gregory who had not been mentioned at the Fink it was the name was taboo and I had no idea what it was Ernest had the only thing he said to me once was he said my uh, Giggy was my my best son and he went bad and I had no idea what that meant and I you know so but when I met him that completely went out of my mind because he was an utter charmer he was great fun and uh, we did not uh, we saw each other over the next three or four years, and then in, in 1966 we got married, and um, and I, you know, had great hopes, as one always does when you get married, and and it, it started out very well. But I learned early on that that Greg had um, 
that there were problems. And uh, he was a doctor. He was a wonderful doctor, but he, he, his problems were too diff became too great for him to practice medicine as he would like to have done. And um, we had some children. We had, and my son Edward is sitting right here in the front row. Has been a great strength to me, and uh, in writing the book, urging me to say, I, "I want you, I want you to write and tell the truth and tell your story." Um, so I did. But um, uh, it's well, I don't quite know. I mean, because I have, you know, I have some wonderful memories with Greg. We did things that I would never have done. On, I mean, I was adventurous, but not anything as adventurous as Greg was. I mean, we did things I would never have done, uh, you know, sailing in, in extraordinary rough seas. He, we, we took trips to, um, well, with the idea that he would work in underdeveloped countries. We went to Nicaragua and Ecuador. We went to... Uh, uh, he, he had a crazy idea once that we'd live in. I thought it would be lovely to live in Ireland, nothing I would have liked better, but he chose a house that was right on the north-south border. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and I mean, it was and right in 1970 at the height when the troubles started. And, uh, you know, Greg had this nose. I mean, he should have been an investigative reporter or something because he had this nose for just getting himself right in the middle of trouble. But um, so that our, our, lives, our lives sort of started and stopped and uh, started and stopped. But um, now I don't know how much more you want me to tell. <laughs> um, I have um, any, any number of follow-up questions, but I'm sure members of the audience do too, and we're running short of time, so I thought okay. perhaps we'd open it up there. And then All right. If, we'll if, if there's a moment, then I will uh, jump you right will, back in there. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. I just want to say how wonderful it is to be here this evening to hear the stories uh, that you're relating. I have a photo of Ernest that was taken in Rhonda in 1959, October of 1959. And it's a photo that I've never seen in any of the Hemingway biographies, picture books, and so forth. Ernest has one arm around Caetano mm -hmm. Ordonez, the other arm around Antonio Ordonez. There's a lot of locals in the background trying to get into the picture. It was taken apparently by a local photographer. Do you, were you with uh, Ernest and Rhonda in October of 1959? I was, yes. Do you recall and this this time, this, this, this instant, this moment in time, perhaps? I'm trying to learn well, more about the photo. The, the photo. Well, I, I remember the, you know, I don't know whether I remember that particular um, moment, but I do remember because Antonio, uh, Rhonda was such a, it was his um, birthplace and the place of his family. And so he, he was the son of Rhonda. And when he went back there, I mean, they really cheered him on. It was a wonderful bullfight. So, uh, it, it, you know, there was great jollity about it. And I believe that, although we didn't see him at the time, that Orson Welles was there at that same time, too. But, uh, you know, I don't, I can't really tell you any more details. I don't know who the, offhand, I don't know who the um, photographer would have been. This photo is so telling because here's Hemingway. The, two, uh, Bridget, the father and son. The father and son. The two best bullfighters, arguably, for their time yes. in Spain. Well, you're lucky to have that photo. I sent this photo to uh, Todd Oliver uh, as he was composing Hemingway from A to Z, and mm -hmm. it is present in that uh, in that volume. But that's I've never seen it published anywhere else, so yeah, I feel I very I'll, lucky. I'll have a look for it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Okay, then I'll just jump right back in. All right. <laughs> um, we, we went momentarily back to the bullfights, and I guess I wanted to um, mention that, that the Ordonezes were the, uh, the, the elder Ordonez was the model for um, the, uh, the, the, what was his name, Pedro in uh, The Sun Also Rises, and that kind of great uh, bullfighter, the, the matador there. Yeah, was it, Rome was Rome it Romero? Romero, Pedro was Romero, it? right, right. Um. Yes, and they were. But, but that made me think of another part of um, your story and uh, Hemingway's um, aesthetic. And, and uh, he was, in some ways, a pioneer of what we called, uh, um, came to be called the new journalism or the nonfiction novel. He uh, allowed um, movable, he, he says in a preface to Movable Feast that readers are welcome to read this as fiction if they wish. 
uh, whereas so much of his fiction is so clearly drawn and based on, like, as the, the Ordonez is, on stories, uh, characters, and people he knew so very well. Um, I wonder how you sort of, uh, since you were typing the manuscript of A Movable Feast, which is uh, one of my favorite books of his, mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder whether you could say something about where it was that he fictionalized and what it was that he, um, where he adhered closely to truth. Well, that's a little bit difficult for me because, um, you know, when he, he told me that he he started that book, he never imagined he'd write a, a memoir of sort. I mean, it is sort of part of his memoirs. But after he, uh, he was injured in the plane, two plane crashes in Africa, and he came back and he had broken his back and he was uh, he was sort of on had to lie down and be quiet for a while. I mean, then he started thinking back on his early life, and especially on his early writing life, and uh, that was Paris. And, and so he started writing um, his notes for it, and then eventually he, he put it into, it was a few years later that he put it into uh, that form, the book form. But um, it, it's very hard with a writer, I mean, even almost with oneself, to tell what is... You know what? What memory? How memory serves you in a uh, uh, thing? I mean, I think he probably thought it was all. Uh, I mean, I don't think any of it was was fiction in mm -hmm. terms of. of uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think he, he thought that's exactly how it was. So, I mean, I wouldn't be able to pull apart and tell you this part of it right. was fiction and this this wasn't. Right, right. Not you know, the way the especially as he wrote it, he probably thought. This is this is it. This is what I remember, or at least this is what I, I want to put down. I mean, because I think he was quite conscious about things. Um, you know, I don't think he was a careless writer in any way. Yeah, oh, no, certainly not one of the most careful that I've ever <laughs> yes. read in my life. Um, you mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question. Thank you. Um, I understand that Ernest Hemingway was not too fond of F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> And I was wondering if you could verify this, and you might elaborate on it a little bit. Well, you know, I would be—I would disagree with you on that. And I mean, I knew Hemingway just for two years, so I can only sort of vouch for what he was like during those two Hard years. To um, but he always told me you know, he loved Scott, and and he—but he was angry with Scott because he felt that he had dissipated his talent and he hadn't, I mean, it was the same sort of way he treated his children. When he expected things of them and they didn't, uh, they didn't, um, uh, you know, come up to expectations, he would get very angry about it. Or he would, he had, you know, stricter guidelines for friends and family than he had for the rest of the world. And he, he felt, he always blamed Zelda, you know, sort of blame the woman. He said <laughs> Zelda was jealous of, uh, of Scott's career and that she did every, used every devious trick to prevent Scott from writing and that eventually she succeeded. Although we know that Zelda uh, was not with him, you know, well, Zelda was, it was in an institution in the later years of her life, but. But I think that he always worried about about Zelda. I mean, Scott, I'm talking, worried about Zelda. But definitely, Ernest always spoke with great affection of Scott uh, to me. And, you know, Scott was the person who was instrumental in getting him published by Scribner's and having a, a Maxwell Perkins was Scott Fitzgerald's editor. And uh, Scott said, oh, well, there's this wonderful new writer, and you must look at his work. And it was Hemingway, and he brought him to Scribner's. And he's with Scribner's to this day, as, as Scribner's you know, exists uh, today as part of Simon and & Schuster and a conglomerate. But, but, that, but I, I do think, I mean, that was definitely my feeling. He never said anything. I mean, the, the things that he said about Scott were really, you know, it was not Scott, you know, he, he was a rummy, but that was not his, you know, his fault. But, and, and I think I put in my book, you know, uh, in a way, if you look at it that way, um, James Joyce was a rummy. But James Joyce is, you know, it, by Ernest's standards, because he drank, whoops, he drank a lot. Uh, but, but Joyce's writing never faltered. And I think that was the way uh, Ernest felt that Scott didn't do his best by his writing. 
and that was letting his friends and family mm -hmm. and himself down. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that was unforgivable for mm -hmm. Ernest. Mm -hmm. But I think affect. I think he had affection for the person. Thank you very much. Since you mentioned um, Hemingway as father, I wanted to go back a bit to the son, and mm -hmm. if we could talk a little bit more about Gregory. You said that they had had a falling out, and it was a, sort of a gradual process of discovery for you of what that falling out was over. I wonder mm -hmm. if you'd be willing to talk about that. Well, I, since I've put it in my book, Greg was a transvestite, which is a, a I don't know whether you want to call it a condition. It was something that was that was little understood, and maybe still is little understood. Certainly, I understand very little about it. And and he felt that was a tragic flaw in his character, and he always felt that he had let his father down. That uh, well, he he always felt it was both ways. He felt that his father never did anything to help him with this condition, and that in some ways his father which might have been true, slightly despised him or looked down on, on him because of it and or tried to ignore it. But he felt his parents never, never got him the help, never, you know, loved him for himself. They felt he has this flaw that, uh, you know, therefore he should be dismissed, as it were. Now, I mean, that's him looking at it. Since Ernest never... Uh, it just didn't allow Greg's name to be used in, in the home. I don't know how Ernest felt about it. I mean, obviously, I know that he he he, um, he said my son went bad, and and that I presume is what he, what he was talking about. But but he was. Uh, I mean, they had a very close relationship when Greg was little. He was an enchanting boy, and and he was a wonderful shot, a wonderful athlete. He was um, very smart, and he went on to get a medical degree. And so I think, I mean, he, all his life he fought against um, being consumed by um, this condition that he had. He really fought against it. I mean, I know that because I was married to him for 20 years. So, um, you know, I, I give him good marks for that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Um, I was wondering, there's actually a paragraph, I was wondering if you would be willing to read, that is one of the most moving in the book. Oh, yes. About. I have, um, this is about, this is what Greg told me about his early life. While his parents were gallivanting in the bush, they're off in Africa on a safari, and out of that safari that's in the 30s came uh, Green Hills of Africa. While his parents were gall gallivanting in the bush, poor little Giggy was being terrorized by Ada, the nurse in charge he was left with in Key West. She ruled by fear, threatening to leave him as his parents had done whenever he was bad. She would put on her hat and coat and walk out slamming the door and not return until his screams and imploring reached an unbearable pitch. She tyrannized him, telling him she was the only one in the world who cared for him and that if he did not behave, she would leave him too. It was during this time, he told me, that he first went to his mother's chest of drawers and took out her stockings and rubbed them against his cheek. Ada did not wear hosiery in the Florida heat. He associated stockings only with his mother, who was gone. He had remembered clinging to her leg and liking the silky feeling and the closeness it brought him to his mother, who was not an affectionate person. Now she was far away. Now that she was far away, he clung to the stockings, which gave him security and a secret joy. That is how it started. That is all there was to it. He, he emphasized, I'm not a transvestite. I do not want to dress up as a woman. It's only the stockings, only the stockings. They're my security blanket, and I cannot give them up. Do you still love me? That was what he told me when he first admitted. I noticed that things were missing or things were <laughs> appearing like uh, lipstick and, and, and stockings, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I thought he must have a girlfriend. And I was, you know, I confided in my Aunt Helen and said, you know, what What do I do? You know, And she said, well, you, you keep your, what was it, your... Um, mouth closed and your eyes open, but um, uh, <laughs> she. she um, mother, I just didn't know. Pun did your mother offer some advice too? No. Oh, oh, my mother. My mother loved Greg. I mean, absolutely loved Greg, and she thought that uh, she said, 
Or she said, oh, it's far nicer than, than going out with, you know, uh, violence and guns. You know, it was so fun. And my mother was, was quite, she, she thought, you know, she said, well, what, what a nice thing. You know? man who's in touch with his feminine <laughs> side, yes, she said. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, wonderful. it was funny. But, um, but yes, that's how, how Greg first told me. And, uh, you know, he, he, he just said it was, it was just something he did to relieve the, you know, when he c couldn't cope with things, it was his way of, of um, taking care of that. You live in Montana now, which seems a far uh, cry from um, Madrid and Dublin and Paris, but you have stayed there. You're committed to it. Could you tell us a little about your life right there? Well, I, I live in Bozeman, and it just surprised me that I've stayed there. I always thought I would leave Montana. I never wanted, you know, not, I never wanted to go there. It just, just it seemed like I, I kept all my life getting further and further away from Ireland. I loved Ireland. Now I could go to Ireland any time, and somehow I stay in Montana. With, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that's all about. But I love Montana. I love to ski in the winter time. Uh, otherwise, I think I would go mad. I mean, I would have to leave. But I love that. Uh, Montana is, it's nice, uh, it's a quiet place. I've just been in New York, well, up in Toronto and before that in New York, and I realize now each year I come back to New York how busy New York is and how, how leisurely I have become. Uh, it, it's, it, there are lots of wonderful writers out in Montana, and some of them were very kind to give me nice blurbs. Uh, uh, Thomas Tom McGuane. This is the best and best written of all the reminiscences of Ernest Hemingway, in part because its adventurous author, Valerie Hemingway, is such an absorbing character herself. <laughs> For once, the great artist, the hero, and, and the fool seem to be the same person, and the long list of fascinating people in his train are seen with a rare frankness. Here, here, true, true. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Brokaw, and, and I mean, we've got some interesting people out there, Jim Harrison, and... Mailer's and still in Massachusetts, though. Mailer's yeah. in, in Provincetown. I talked to him recently, and huh. uh, he's still there. Can't get him to come out to Montana. He came close when he did uh, the Executioner's Song, and he, he sent me up a letter, and he, he must have dictated it to his um, secretary, because... Uh, you know, he put Dear Valerie, in, and then it was Norman. And then when the, she addressed the envelope, she, all she knew, she just put Valerie, Bridger Canyon Road. In those <laughs> days, 20 years ago, it was delivered to me. It was just amazing that it got. But nowadays, I'm afraid the way things have got so automated and, and uh, um, Montana's got so um, smug and smart, you know, they wouldn't, they'd send it back to owner, you know, send He'd send you an email anyway. Yes. Yeah. Question. Yes. Uh, a long time ago, I th think I read a uh, critique of Hemingway that suggested that he wrote about bullfighting and hunting in Africa because he was insecure about his masculinity. Did you ever get any sense of that, or is that just easy psycho babble? I'd be inclined to say it's the latter, because I, <laughs> I found that, it, I mean, he, he seemed to me, and as I say, I'm looking back, I'm a 19-year-old, I meet him, he certainly seemed very secure in his masculinity when I knew him, you know, he just was a, a secure person. I mean, he, he loved to, he hunted from when he was tiny, you know, his father had he, all his early years, that was part of his persona, he, he uh, hunted and he loved, and Africa has a, uh, it draws people. Once you go there, you always want to go back. I mean, I've been a couple of times, and I just love it. But, uh, but that, I mean, I think sometimes, and, and this is why I'm very grateful I spent two years around Hemingway, um, because I was able to see him, you know, continuously, because so many of the, the stories and the, that one reads, it's just one little, you know, it's like one glimpse, and you don't see the rest. You see that hour of the day, you don't see the other 23 hours. And I did see him around the clock, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, you know, I would disagree with that, just mm -hmm. based on what I know. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Mailer, and there's a, a very dramatic moment in the book when you are with uh, Mailer and Beverly Bentley, I think, and you're watching a uh, and you see, watching television, you see Jack, Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby. Yeah, could Was you just shot. Yeah, shot him shoot Oswald? And that brings us 
to the Kennedy Library. You were also here when it opened in 1981. And I wonder if you could uh, tell us anything about that day. Well, I, I remember that that was Mary Hemingway was supposed to come and open a, a, the um, well, come to represent the Hemingway family because actually it was Mary who uh, she had this great um, admiration for JFK and then later for for Jackie and uh, I mean right from the beginning so many people wanted the Hemingway papers I mean they were really coveted and Mary said they're going to the Kennedy Library. Before even there was a Kennedy Library, I mean, was, I put, worked with the papers and put them together for years, and it was always, Mary never faulted in that. It was the Kennedy Library. She wanted Hemingway and Kennedy, you know, her heroes together. And, um, but that, so it, it was, I mean, it was sad for me that Mary couldn't be there, you know, that, that day, but I, I remember because we were at a hotel nearby, and George Plimpton, that's another person we've lost in the last, uh, few months, but or maybe year. Time just, you know, it's, it accelerates when you get older. But uh, I, I just remember it as being a, a wonderful occasion and being able to think back and, and, and uh, to Hemingway's friends and, and also to the Kennedy family. Last question from the audience, then I have one more. Time. Part of the entourage in 1959 was Dr. George Saviors, Hemingway's uh, personal physician. What are your recollections about uh, George Saviors during the uh, dangerous summer? Well, I, I like George very much. And George is the person who he came up, and it was funny, not funny, but at Mary's funeral, George came up and he, and he said, you know, do you remember me? And, of course, once he said who he was, I mean, at the time I, I didn't recognize him or maybe I wasn't thinking, but he said, I'm George Saviors. And I, I just remember... Ernest had, had a great fondness for him. And George uh, traveled around with us quite a bit because I remember he was in Valencia and I mentioned how um, Beverly Bentley and I were thinking, oh, we want to get away from all these old funny daddies for a little bit. You know, I mean, I know that doesn't quite fit in with Ernest being, it, it was fantastic, but there were times when you just felt you wanted to do, you wanted to do something different and to make off on your own. And uh, Ernest said, George up, uh, because we said we weren't feeling well. Ernest sent George up to our bedroom to check out. <laughs> and he ordered, uh, we had to make these lies up about how, how what our, our ailments were. And, and, and so then in, in return, we got this very bland dinner. But George was always, he was great fun. And when I went back to, when I went to catch him with, with Mary the next year after Ernest died, he was... Uh, you know, he was there, and he really was a tower of strength for Mary um, because he'd been very closely connected with, um, well, he was the one who helped get Ernest into the Mayo Clinic and had gone with them, and, and when Ernest was at the Mayo Clinic, it was under George's name. And, I mean, he was a very valued and true family friend, and I always felt that um, in later years, yes. Thank you. Um, it's clear that... Uh, much more than seven-eighths of this book is going to remain submerged in our conversation because we're just about out of time. I have one last question, if I may. Yes. Um, early in the book, you write, while Cabra stimulated young minds and provided a secure and sheltered haven, it gave us few tools for tackling a secular life. The highest we girls could aspire to, we were told, was to join the order to become a nun. Being a wife and mother rated a poor second, no other alternatives were considered. Yet as I, as I read your wonderful book, I wondered if what kind of education could have prepared you for this life? Well, this was, was for the life that, that I you led. Had, yes. <laughs> I think I, I was very lucky. I mean, I don't regret a moment of any of it. I mean, obviously one has to take the, the bad with the good. But, you know, even the bad strengthens you. I mean, that was certainly, the, the nuns told us this, you know, that life is a veil of tears, but if you get through it, there's a reward on the other side. But, I mean, I feel I've had lots of rewards over the years. Uh, and, and it was a wonderful education because it was very, it was a very introspective education. And, and I just think, and I find that so sort of, 
useful today when, when we have such an invasive world. You know, everywhere you go, you, you, there's television on, there's something being fed to you. You know, you, you have to, and I'm able to um, withdraw from that. And, and remember, I mean, one of the things we, we learned a lot of was poetry. And I'm able, you know, I stand at a bus stop, I'm waiting for something in between things. I recall poetry, and, and about three weeks ago, I was up in Pittsburgh, and my friend Seamus Heaney was also there, and, uh, and uh, you know, we were reminiscing about, you know, the, the usefulness of an Irish education and how wonderful it is to have a store of, of poetry and literature in your head. I mean, those were the things that they were probably, I mean, we learned them in, in, in a way that wouldn't be taught today that you got a clout if you didn't, if the lines didn't follow each other. That doesn't happen, but I'll tell you, it was worth every clout. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valerie Hemingway, on behalf Thank you. of the... I just wanted to, yeah, uh, I was going to say that one. Certainly one of my rewards has been having this conversation, and I wanted to um, tell everybody that uh, Valerie will be signing books in the bookstore. I'm sure that you will want to seize this moment. I think there might be a couple of copies left. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Valerie, that was just wonderful. Oh, I mean, you know, you were just... <laughs>